Good morning. Good morning. Or as we say on the island, aloha. <laughs> it is uh, good to be back on this uh, first Sunday of Advent. Um, we had a, a, a wonderful time away, Becky and I did, and uh, a very restful and relaxing time. We're glad to welcome you who are here in the sanctuary, and i got to remember to say hello to the folks at home. Folks at home, if you're watching on Facebook, leave me a comment in the comment section, and I'll answer you after worship just to kind of say hello to you as well. Uh, it, I'm glad to be back uh, with you this morning. I've learned several things while I was gone. Um, one is that it is okay to go to church in flip-flops and shorts in a Hawaiian shirt. So if you want to do that next week, you feel free. You've got my blessing. Uh, the other thing is that I learned that I am nowhere near ready to retire. Because if we hadn't been traveling, Becky would have been peeling me off the ceiling uh, after about eight weeks of, uh, of not doing this. Um, so I, I'm glad to be back um, give you the brief medical update. Um, you know, as I left, that uh, the situation seemed to change for Becky. And uh, as it frequently does when you're dealing with cancer, it's changed again. Becky has responded in miracle fashion to this experimental treatment. And... Uh, her, uh, her CA-125 count went from about 7,700 to 852, wow. and uh, she will probably be one of the most successful people who's gotten this experimental treatment, and uh, the doctors have told us, uh, kind of forget about that few months, we're just going to go on treating her now for as long as we can. So, uh, so thanks be to God, we are back, and uh, we enjoyed a wonderful Thanksgiving with our family, and, uh, and we are here to worship with you today on this first Sunday of Advent. My favorite time of the year, and there is lots going on in the life of our church uh, in Advent. Today we start our Advent series of worship services, which is going to be a little bit different than you might have been used to. Uh, you might have been used to the four Sundays of Advent being the Sundays of hope and joy and love and peace. Remember those four themes that we've had each week? Uh, this year, there are going to be four different themes. It's going to be faith and hope and rejoicing and gratitude. So today, we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about faith and about what true faith is. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, our friends Abraham and Sarah and the story from Genesis to do that. I want to remind you that next Sunday is an important day in the life of the church. Next Sunday, following this worship service, will be our annual charge conference. Uh, you are all invited to stay if you would like to. We're going to have a, some kind of a soup luncheon, and we're going to do a charge conference. Our DS, uh, Reverend Nola Anderson, will be here to conduct that conference for us. And then we're going to head off to Summerfield Village and uh, do some Christmas caroling and bell ringing with the residents there at Summerfield next Sunday afternoon at about 1.30. You are invited to do that. And if you want to get involved with that, see Dan and Lisa who are working on a list so that uh, we're sure that everybody arrives at the right time in the right place. The angel and mitten trees are up and being used. We've got to get those angels off the angel tree and into uh, your hands so that the gifts can get back and they can get distributed in time for Christmas. If you're interested in that, uh, see Shelley for more information about that. The Advent study starts on Wednesday at 1 o'clock. And uh, the study this year is the angels of Christmas. We're going to look at four different times that angels appeared in the Christmas story and told us part of the information about the Christmas story. I have the books in the office. If you need one, let me know. I'll get you a book. Uh, you want to read the introduction and the first chapter for Wednesday at 1 o'clock when we gather. Uh, next Sunday, we also start taking poinsettia orders. Uh, you can see Phyllis out there in the uh, narthex next week and uh, order poinsettias to decorate the uh, Christmas altar. And today is United Methodist Student Sunday. There are special envelopes out there uh, if you want to participate in uh, helping to provide scholarships for United Methodist students throughout the country. Uh, you can fill one of these little envelopes out and put it in the offering plate. 
You can also put in the offering plate your commitment cards, your pledge cards for 2023, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet. Just put them right in the plate today, and, uh, and we will be glad to receive those gifts. All right, prayer concerns. Do we have any prayer concerns that we want to lift up today? Yes, Darlene. Okay. And we were told that he had three so we will pray for Edward and for his healing. Thank you. Yes, Mike. Okay. We'll be praying for Mike's friend Paul for healing from surgery. I'm repeating those for the folks who are at home so that they too can be joining us in our prayer requests. Yes, Shelley. Okay. A prayer for Christine Black for healing following surgery. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. David had a knee replacement. We'll pray for his healing as he recovers from surgery. Other prayer requests? Yes, Amy. Net. Jeanette. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. We are praying for for you and your family, Warren, as you uh, prepare to say goodbye to your brother and uh, celebrate a life that was well lived. We will keep you all in prayer, Barbara, as well as uh, you and Janet. Any other prayer requests, prayer concerns? Behind me. Yes. For our son, Chris, who is treating for colorectal cancer. Okay. We're praying for Chris's healing as he undergoes cancer treatment. Any other prayer requests? Anybody here got a birthday today? An anniversary? Something going on this week that they want to give thanks for? Yes. We give thanks for wedding anniversaries, and uh, the higher the number, the better the pain tolerance. No, no, the, uh, the, the more in love people grow. I just got in trouble with that one. Any other things we want to give thanks for today? All right, we are going to light our first Advent candle. It's a uh, responsive reading that Gary is going to uh, lead you through. And uh, the words will be on the screen, so join with Gary. Hey, now you get the dark bowl, friend. Here are these words from Galatians 3. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All Gentiles shall be blessed in you. And so we too... Wait upon the Lord. Be strong, Be strong and courageous. Wait upon the Lord. That's what Abraham did, even though he was about a hundred years old. And Sarah's womb was barren. Still, Abraham waited. Fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Wait upon the Lord. I will say verse one of the Advent song. Should be on the screen if not, it's 2090 and your face is safe.
Oh God, we do pray that you're going to be here with us this time in this sanctuary here in your house as we uh, begin our Advent journey together. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we too might arrive at that manger in Bethlehem ready to receive you fully. And we pray this today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our opening song is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, a great Advent hymn. We're going to sing the first two verses. Will you stand if you're able and join us as we sing? Before you're seated, I want to invite you to turn and greet somebody around you and welcome them to worship. We're going to listen now as Gary reads for us the first two of our scripture readings and pay particular attention to the Genesis reading. And I'm going to be talking about it in just a few minutes. Got it. First reading is from Genesis chapter 17, 1 through 9. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 4, 13 through 21. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offsprings received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. 
For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do we have uh, young people who want to come down today? If not, you're all going to be young people today. I know for some of you that's a welcome announcement today. So uh, I want to uh, show you a couple pictures and see if you can identify them. Uh, Here is the first one. I know it's a little small. Very good. It is the emblem of the Girl Scouts. And the one that goes with it is this one. The Boy Scouts. That's right. That's the Boy Scout emblem. How many people here have ever been a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout? Look at all the hands. What is the motto of both of those groups? My, it's a little quiet here in the sanctuary. The model motto of both the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts, be prepared. Very good. It is the same motto for both, the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts, be prepared. I started thinking a little bit about how it is that we prepare for things. How it is that we prepare on this first Sunday of Advent for the coming of Christmas. Just tell me some of the preparations that are going on now or will go on in your house fairly soon. Cleaning. Deck the halls. Decoration. Deck the halls. Parties. Parties. Christmas tree. Cookie day, near and dear to my heart. Thank you very much. (laughs) That should be a holiday by itself. Cookie day. What else? Stress over buying presents. Buying presents. Wrapping presents. Uh, Who's got lights on the outside of their house yet? Okay, good. Who's got a Christmas tree up all decorated already? Wow, look at that. All right, you are well on the way to preparation. So since you're so well on the way to preparation, young people... How are you preparing for the child on Christmas? Because everything you have named so far on January 1st gets put away. The lights come down. The cookies get eaten or go stale. The presents get worn or returned. The lights on the outside of the house come down. But how are you preparing for the Christ child? (coughs) What are you consciously doing this Advent to prepare for the arrival of the Christ child, who I pray you will not put away the first week in January and say, I don't have to think about that again until next year? Might you 
decide to commit to some special act during Advent? Might you decide to uh, be part of an Advent Bible study? Might you decide to undertake some mission project during Advent? You want to get involved in sleep in heavenly peace, and you're going to get your group of friends, rather than having a party when you exchange gifts for each other, to have a party to see how many sets of bedding you can come up with for the kids that sleep in heavenly peace. There's lots of ways that you can begin to prepare your heart for the reception of that child. And I will tell you, friends, everything you can do to prepare your heart is more important than any Christmas light you will hang this year. Lori. Good. Kids in the nursery next week are going to be doing some painting and making Christmas ornaments. That's a good way to prepare. Hopefully they're preparing their hearts as well. Let's pray. God, watch over all of your children. Be they young or be they not so young. And let our hearts be open so that we can prepare for the coming of the babe. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to listen now and enjoy the choir anthem that the choir has prepared for us.
This morning, our gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew's gospel in the first chapter. It's the alternative story of the birth of Jesus. And I say alternative because it isn't the Luke gospel account that we are much more familiar with than here on Christmas Eve. Uh, This is a short and condensed version. Apparently, Matthew had somewhere to be, so he decided to write it in a lot shorter uh, words than uh, old Luke did. It also starts in the middle of a long line of figuring out the genealogy of Jesus. So the reading begins in the 16th verse of that first chapter and actually starts in the middle of a verse. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Remain comfortably seated and let's join in singing the first two verses of the Advent song, Lift Up Your Heads. Join your heart with mine in a word of prayer. Oh God, as we gather today, I pray that you will bless the words of my lips, that you will bless the meditation of all of our hearts, and that somehow something that we do in the next few moments will bring a smile to the face of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, part of the time that we were away and the advent of a new Kindle reader allowed me the opportunity to reread part of some books that I have enjoyed uh, over the course of my life. And one of them was the book Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose. Ambrose tells the story in this book of Lewis and Clark's expedition in the early 1800s. 
I know some of you are about ready to nod off as I begin that way, but it really is a good story. Because the expedition, after facing massive challenges like hunger and fatigue, the desertion of some of their troops, illness, finally sees them reach the headwaters of the Missouri River near Three Forks, Montana. Now, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark believed that from the information that their advanced scouts had given them, once they reached the Continental Divide, just about 100 miles west of Three Forks, why, they would just have an easy half-day's walk to the waters of the Columbia River, and there they'd have an easy float out to the Pacific Ocean. The hard part of their journey was over. It was time to celebrate, friends. Or so they thought. And so they climbed the bluffs near the Continental Divide, expecting to see that great river there ahead of them. So imagine their shock when instead of seeing the great river, they became the first non-Native Americans to see the Rocky Mountains. They couldn't go back. And there was no clear way to go forward. We have a word for that, I think. It's the word trapped. Maybe, maybe you know that feeling today. I think that we all do in some way or shape or form. Maybe you've recently conquered a bad habit only to suffer a relapse. Maybe you feel stuck in a dead-end marriage or a dead-end job or a dead-end life or all of the above. And just like Lewis and Clark, you find today you can't go back and there's no clear way forward. That's why we have a word for that too. Trapped. And with that thought in mind, welcome to the world of Abraham and Sarah. Their story starts out in Genesis 11. Abram, as he was called back then, was the son of a man named Terah. His family was from the ancient Babylonian city called Ur, U-R. And it was in Ur that Abraham met Sarai. That was her name back then as well. At some point, Abram married Sarai, and they moved from Ur to Haran, a city on the Tigris River. And then... God shows up. And in Genesis 12, God calls Abram and Sarai to go to the land of Canaan where God would make a great nation through them. Through Abram and Sarai. Now, Abram was 65 years old at the time, and Sarai was 55. And in Genesis 11.30, we are told that Sarai was barren. So can you imagine what Abram and Sarai must have said to God that day? A great nation? But God, we can't even have children. And look how old we are. And so they waited. And they waited some more. But still, no offspring. But still they waited. And they're still waiting later on in Genesis when Abram is now 86 years old and Sarai is 76. And by this point, they are probably pretty disappointed. So who could blame them when Sarai pushed this woman named Hagar into Abram's tent and nine months later that union gave birth to Ishmael? But now we fast forward in Genesis another 13 years, and in Genesis 17, Abram is 99 years old. 
and Sarai is 89, and she is still barren. And their household by now is probably filled with strife and rancor because of this Hagar and Ishmael situation. And we have a word for that as well, don't we? It's the word trapped. And again, God shows up. And in Genesis 17, God tells us, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared and said, I am the God Almighty. And the Hebrew phrase behind that title, God Almighty, is El Shaddai. And El Shaddai means God is sufficient. God is able. God is powerful. El Shaddai means that God is almighty. And what does El Shaddai do when he shows up? Well, he cuts a covenant. Now that term covenant applies five times in the reading from Genesis 17. And in the rest of that 17th chapter that we didn't read today, it appears another eight times. Friends, I'm thinking that when God mentions something 13 times in one chapter of the Bible, God is trying to make a point. In the Old Testament, covenants were not made. Because people didn't sign their names to pieces of paper like we do today to make a covenant. There were no attorneys or notary publics. Sorry, Gary. Sorry, Steve or any other attorney here. But there was blood. And that's because in the Old Testament, people cut covenants. They killed animals by slitting their throats and poured out their blood. Covenant cutting, I guess, was pretty messy business. God fulfilled God's covenant promise to Abraham and Sarah through the birth of Isaac. All the more, God fulfilled God's promise to us through the birth of a son, too. His name is Jesus. That's what we're looking for as we start out celebrating this Advent season. God shows up again. Now, you know that there was blood involved in this story at Gethsemane, at Golgotha. The everlasting covenant promise to Abraham, however, is signed, sealed, and delivered to you. It's signed in the Savior's cleansing blood, sealed by the Holy Spirit, delivered in the means of grace, the gospel, baptism, and holy communion, where Jesus says what? This blood of my covenant is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But you know, in our lives, when we are trapped, we often hear other voices. Maybe we hear the voices that tell us, just party your way out of this situation. Or we hear material voices that tell us, spend your way out of it. Or individual voices that tell us that you are the way out of it. Or even fatalistic voices that say there is no way out. And if we listen to those voices long enough, you and I, our feeling of despair becomes this insidious virus that destroys our body and our mind and our soul. And we try to do what? We try to self-medicate, which only gets us further into patterns of self-sabotage. You know, when you and I feel trapped, we certainly don't whistle while we work, do we? And when others whistle while they work, we give them the look. You know the look. The look like this. Are you being naive? Don't you know that airplanes fall out of the sky? That bull markets go bare? That terrorists terrorize? That people turn bad? That the other shoe is going to drop? That there's this fine print you have to read? Feeling trapped in a dead-end job or a dead-end relationship can twist us into an emotional pretzel. 
I read this story about a Hungarian man named Andras Thomas. He fought for the Germans in World War II, and the Soviets captured him in 1944. Now pay attention to the math here, friends. He was sent to a Russian gulag, and there Andras Thomas lost his mind. After he was transferred to a mental hospital, the Soviets, whose, whose system really wasn't exactly a model of efficiency, eventually forgot who he was. It wasn't until 1998, some 54 years later, that a doctor recognized that Andres Thomas was speaking Hungarian. Everybody else they thought he was crazy. <clears throat> Once his medical file was opened for the first time in decades, the doctors found out his case history and notified the authorities in Hungary. And that POW finally returned home in 1999 to a hero's welcome. And he is known as the last prisoner of World War II. Today... Some of us may even feel like we're at the end of our rope. But friends, hear this loud and clear. God has shown up in Jesus Christ. We're not trapped. You see, sin can't trap us. Jesus forgives that. Death can't trap us because Jesus conquered that. Hopelessness cannot trap us because Jesus hears our prayer. What does that all mean? Well, no matter how you might be feeling trapped right now, caring for small children, worrying about teenagers, a broken heart, taking care of elderly parents, an overwhelming feeling that everything's gone terribly wrong, wait upon the Lord with faith. Because in Christ's everlasting blood covenant with you, death is dead. Sin is forgiven. Hope is eternal. The victory has been won. And we have a word for that, too. It's free. The waiting is over. Christ was born. God showed up. Jesus is our Emmanuel, our God with us. In that little baby, you and I are free forever. And in that little baby, maybe you can hear the words of Jesus in this song. I will come to you in the silence. I will lift you from all your fear. You will hear my voice. I claim you as my choice. Be still and know I am here. I am hope for all who are hopeless. I am eyes for all who long to see. In the shadows of the night, I will be your light. Come and rest in me. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me, I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. I am strength for all the despairing healing for the ones who dwell in shame 
All the blind will see, the lame will all run free, and all will know my name. I am the word that leads all to freedom. I am the peace the world cannot give. I will call your name, embracing all your pain. Stand up now, walk and live. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. We're going to pause now and receive this morning's offerings of gifts and tithes. And we want to thank you for all of those gifts that you have given. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, if you have not yet had a chance to fill out your commitment card for 2023, Uh, You can do that this morning and put it right in the plate. I'm sure there are extra cards on the back table out there if you need to get them. Uh, The ushers will be glad to get you one. We're going to listen to uh, some wonderful special music our musicians are going to offer us as we offer our gifts to God. Let's stand and bring our gifts to God as we sing All Earth is Waiting. All Earth is waiting, waiting to see the promised one. And the open furrows, the sowing of the Lord. All the earth is waiting, sings to liberty. It cries out for justice. And searches for the truth. Accept, O God, these offerings, the portion that you have asked us to give as a sign of our trust in you and our faith in your promises. And receive these gifts, our free gifts of gratitude for all that you have done. Bless them in your work. A work in which surely life triumphs over death and the light over darkness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to sing a one verse of uh, How Great Is Our God, and that will lead us into our prayer time together.
Oh God, we thank you that you have given us such an enduring hope. One that cannot ever disappoint us or mislead us. We thank you that through our faith in you and in your son, Jesus Christ, you enter into every believing heart and make new lives that have been torn apart by the darkness of this world. We pray today, O God, that those believers who are asleep may somehow awaken and know that your salvation is nearer than when they first believed. Help them, help us, to lay aside all of the works of darkness and instead to put on the armor of light that you bestow on those who seek you day by day. We pray, O God, today for those whose faith rests in Christmas rather than in Christ. We ask that you would hear our prayers that we lift before you today as we pray for Chris and David and Christine and Paul and Edward. Hear us as we pray for Warren and Janet, for Barbara and her family, for Jeanette and Dave and their families. Hear us as we pray for those whose health is of great concern. Hear us as we give thanks for blessings, that the joys of wedding anniversaries and birthdays, and for the chance we had this week to celebrate a holiday with families and friends. We pray that you'll grant traveling mercies to those who are headed home this day. Keep them safe until families can be reunited once again. And we ask you to hear us now as we pray the prayers that are in our hearts. Lord, here in this time of silence, hear us as we pray the prayers that we carry with us. Oh God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the true light of the world and who taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand for the words of benediction this morning? Friends, go in peace. And may God bless you today with a living faith. May God draw your minds to the inheritance that has been won for you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and by the power of God and by your faith. May you be kept safe until the day of salvation. Amen. We're going to sing two verses of our closing hymn, We Walk by Faith.
ask everybody to join with me in reading the words of commission. All in the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our 